My name is Judy Graham. I live in Ottawa. My father, John Ogston, enlisted with the Royal Canadian Air Force in Winnipeg, Manitoba in March of 1941. He was 26 years old, married to my mother, Jay, and I was three. At the time, he was working as a clerk in a Safeway grocery store in Winnipeg. In response to an appeal by the British government, an urgent recruitment drive was underway for radar technicians. My father was either directed into or chose that branch of the RCAF. After receiving basic instruction in Canada, he was sent to England in the fall of 1941 for further training and operational experience. Early in 1942, he was posted to Ceylon, Sri Lanka. He traveled by troop ship by way of Durban, South Africa to Bombay, India, and from there to Colombo, Ceylon. By that time, he was thoroughly sick of the sea and ships and very happy to re reach his destination. He was kitted out in tropical gear. Between 1942 and 1945, he served on two radi radar sites, which, because again of secrecy, were not called that. They were called Air Ministry Experimental Stations or AIMS. He wasn't able to reveal where he was, but service records indicate that he was first at a place called Rocky Point and then at Batakaloa, both on the east coast of Ceylon south of Tr Trincomalee. Why was he sent to Ceylon? The time of his enlistment probably had a lot to do with it. On the same day that Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, an attack was also launched against the British colony of Hong Kong. After 18 days of ferocious fighting in which the Winnipeg Grenadiers played an important role, the colony surrendered on Christmas Day Singapore fell in February of 1942 and Rangoon, Burma in March. Colombo, Ceylon was attacked on the 5th of April, 1942 and Trincomalee on the 9th. The British rushed to expand their radar network throughout India and Ceylon. Time does not permit me to tell the story of RCAF squadron leader, Leonard Birchall, called the savior of Ceylon, or about the exploits of other Canadians who served in Southeast Asia. But their stories make exciting and inspirational reading and are well worth researching. Of the 12 letters I have written by my father to his mother and his four sisters, I've chosen two well, the first is, a, is actually a composite of two letters written from England, and the second is from Ceylon. Letter one, December the 1st, 41, quote, somewhere in England, unquote. Dear sis, well, here is another labor of love, kid. I'm writing enough letters to supply a community. We haven't much to do around here in our time off, so we spend a good part of it in corresponding to friends and relatives. As you may have heard, I spent a weekend in London and had a swell time sightseeing, etc. My pal Dick and I went together and hitchhiked both ways, thus saving 15 shillings railway fare. We got there 70 miles with one lift, but it took us nine to get back including a 10 mile stretch in a station wagon full of very affectionate foxhounds. I'm coming along very well in the course and I'm working hard on it. I like the work very much and have decided to keep on with it after the war if it is at all possible. I might get a good job over here. I hope that you are all well and are getting along okay. Give my regards to the family and write soon. I'll be waiting to hear from you. So long for now. Cheers, Johnny. Blackpool, England, March the 2nd, 1942. 
Dear Elsie, as you will have heard when this reaches you, I am at present on overseas draft. God knows when or where I am going. I hope it is Canada, though it seems more likely that it will be India, Australia, or the Middle East. I'm keeping my fingers crossed anyway. I was told I would probably get my tapes when I got back from leave, this corporal's tapes, but they looked over my record and saw I had only had 10 days, of, 10 days operational. The minimum is three months. So I was a bit disappointed, but they're right. It would be a little too soon. I did get A group in my LAC, however, leading air craftsman. That means a fairly substantial increase for Jay. Well, sis, that's all the gen for just now. I'll try and write again soon. I am fine and hope you are still the same. So long for now, Johnny. Letter number two. LAC Hogston JS, RAF Ceylon, March the 1st, 43. Dear Elsie, hello old thing. Thanks for the combined Christmas and New Year's letter card. You'll be surprised to know that I got it in time, or almost in time. I think I've written to you since then, at least I hope I have. If not, then I ought to be ashamed of myself. There has been a big change in our young hero's life since the last chapter. He has been posted. Don't hold your breath, dear reader. He's still on the beautiful island of Ceylon. He has only gone from one place to another place. Yes, I've left the station where I had spent eight happy and carefree months amongst the snakes and mosquitoes and have moved to a much more salubrious, question mark, place. Nice new cajuns, thatched huts with cement floors. Beneath towering coconut palms, where you go to sleep with the soft thud of falling coconuts swishing in your ears. Just about a hundred feet away, the blue Indian Ocean sends the white surf rolling up miles of golden sand. My, don't that sound lovely. Really though, it's quite a nice spot and is within a reasonable distance of what we, for lack of a better name, are pleased to call civilization. We are allowed two Liberty runs a week to this place. A Liberty Run is a thing in which scores of airmen with shiny shoes and slicked down hair cram into a lorry, go anywhere from four to 40 miles, get out, stand in a queue for an hour to see a picture, then eat the equivalent of three square meals, pile into the lorry again, get back at midnight, and then go on duty till eight pack Emma. That's what I did anyway. I was kind of sorry to leave my old unit. I had a lot of real pals there. It was kind of nice to have them all come over and grab your hand and say, sorry you're leaving, old man. I know they meant it. Oh well, such is life. Here today, gone tomorrow. Some of the Canadians bind about the English saying they can't get along with them. It's funny, I've noticed the loudmouthed ones who are always shooting a line do the complaining. The English boys have a knack of deflating line shooters. Hope you don't get the idea from my letters that our life is one round of pleasure. We have our little fun, but we do a lot of hard work as well. I suppose it's because we can't say much about our work that makes us spend so much time on the inconsequential details but we were on duty on an average of about 60 hours a week and Sunday is just another day for us. So you see, we do something to earn the money they pay us. There are times when we can relax a bit on duty and there are times when we have to work damn hard. I like it though. I was never afraid of hard work. I spend a lot of my spare time reading about this kind of stuff and studying it in the hope that someday I might get to know something about it. As I was telling Jay in a letter, not having a background in this work takes a lot of getting over. Some of the NCOs have been in the game for years and years, 
and the subject is practically endless, there's always something new coming out. I think I'm repeating myself here, but I hope you had a decent Christmas and New Year. I hear our youngest sister is developing into quite a singer. Isabel was almost raving about her. Hope she keeps her lessons up. Well, Elsie, better close up for the night now. Hope you are all well at 9.03 and are getting along okay. Lots of love to the Barons and you. I'll be writing again soon. Your brother, John. My father was lucky in many ways. Had he chosen the Winnipeg Grenadiers instead of the RCAF, he would probably have been sent to Hong Kong, either to be killed outright or to spend three years as a Japanese prisoner of war. He was lucky in being sent to Ceylon rather than to a more active war zone. After the initial attacks, the Japanese launched no further attacks against the island, although my father's letters reveal that the possibility remained at the back of everyone's mind and the radar installations had to be kept operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All my father had to deal with were the heat and humidity, tropical diseases, he did contract malaria while he was there, snakes, isolation, monotony, and the worry and sadness arising from separation from family, and especially from not being a part of the lives of his child, his wife, and his sisters. Finally, he was lucky to have been trained in the fast developing science of radar which launched him on his RCAF career in tele telecommunications, including computers. I want to thank David McGuffin and the Letters in a Time of War project for giving me an opportunity to provide a glimpse into the life of just one of the over 730 Canadians who served on radar in the Southeast Asia Theater in World War II also just holding the letters in my hand and imagining my father writing them in Ceylon gave me a better understanding of him and helped close the gap created by his absence from my life in my early years. While visiting a friend at the Purdy Rideau Veterans Home a few years ago, I went to speak to the commissioner on duty at the front desk, probably a military man himself. And I asked him whether they were going to do anything special to commemorate BJ, to commemorate BJ Day, which was coming up soon. Oh, that had nothing to do with us, he replied. That was the Americans. Sadly, that view is still widely held. And it does a lamentable disservice to all of those Canadians involved in all three branches of the armed forces in all parts of, Southeast, of the Southeast Asia and Pacific theaters during World War II. Saturday, I will be thinking of them and I will be thanking them 